I have a, a, a very important uh, message this morning. Um, so as Pastor Vlad said, I, I do a lot of work. Um, I, I'm kind of a strange guy. You go, well, what do you do? You know, I'm an author. I'm a teacher. You're in the Middle East. You lead tours to Saudi Arabia. You know, you do a lot of different things. You're pro-Israel. You love Muslims. You know, who exactly are you? So I was... Um, January of 20, where are we now? January 2020. That was just before COVID, right? Gosh, it's the past few years have just flown by. So I was with a tour group with a ministry that I've um, been partnering with for the past several years, and we were in Israel. So we brought a Christian tour group to Israel. Now, most often when Christian tour groups go to Israel, they go to all the holy sites. They go, okay, this is where... Jesus did this, or, you know, Paul did this, or this sort of thing, and, and that's, those are wonderful trips, but we were trying to essentially bring Christians over to show Christians the security situation that Israel lives under, to help them understand what the average Israeli lives with in terms of this ongoing threat to their, their very existence. And so one of the things we did is we went down to a little farming community. They're called Moshav, a Moshav um, on the border of Gaza. So this was, again, three and a half years ago. And they gave us a, a tour of their beautiful little community. I mean, a very small, tight-knit, very um, beautiful farming community. And the gentleman that was giving us the tour, he explained that their children, many of them have really pretty severe PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, because an event happened a few years prior where a rocket actually hit their kindergarten when they were in school. So think about this, kids five, six years old, just starting to go to school, and rockets are hitting their school. And so he was trying to help us to understand what daily life is like for them. And um, on October 7th, just several weeks ago now, I was with another tour group. We were in Saudi Arabia. And so I bring groups to Saudi Arabia, which, of course, is a very different nation from Israel. But we were, so Saudi Arabia is just south of Israel, sort of to the south and to the east. And so we were only, we were staying very close to the border, of Jordan. There's a very short distance between the border of Jordan and then Israel. And so we were 15 miles from the border of Israel. So at night, you could look up and see the city lights of the city of Elat, which is sort of the southernmost city of Israel. And all of a sudden, the story started flooding in, and I was getting texts, and when I started looking at social media. And these terrorists always post videos of what they do. They, they're very proud of what they do. And we were watching videos of Palestinians from the Gaza Strip who infiltrated Israel into some of these communities, going into homes, murdering families as they were breaking bread um, for their, it was a holy day, you know, their Thanksgiving, so to speak. There was a concert down there um, on the border. It was a peace festival. And th what happened, you know, when all was said and done, and I knew it immediately, they, they immediately announced like 80 people dead. And I had friends in the country that were saying, no, oh, there's hundreds already. And found out that there were over 20 people killed at that community that we visited just a few years ago. 20 people in a small little community. There was... Another one right next to it that lost over 100 people. And these are people just like you and me. Families just like ours, beautiful little children, wives murdered, daughters kidnapped, raped. And it was incredibly emotional. I was trying not to uh, let the emotion of it overwhelm me as I was trying to talk to this group and, and focus on what we were doing, but just knowing that an absolute demonic nightmare was unfolding just over the border. So the title of the message today, or at least the, the theme, the subject of the message, is why we as Christians should stand in solidarity with Israel. 
in the days and weeks since then, I've watched the global reaction to this terrorist invasion of Israel. And we've watched as hundreds of thousands of people have flooded the streets of major cities across Europe and even the United States in support of the men who murdered and slaughtered and raped and killed and kidnapped thousands of people. We've watched global support rally for that. And as Pastor Vlad said, you watch TikTok and you go, these are not just Palestinians in exile in London or New York City who are saying, we support what they did because ultimately they're oppressed by the juggernaut, powerful Israel, the occupiers, the colonialists, and all this different sort of thing. It's not just these Palestinians, but it's American children who are getting their postgraduate degrees at university, who are studying post-colonialism or whatever. And they're joining them in the streets, and they believe that it is the cause of justice of the day. You've got the, some of the strangest things in the world, like these LGBTQ LMNOP activists. LGBTQ, LMNOP, XYZ. And they're, they're supporting the Palestinian terrorists. Like gay and lesbian, transgender, whatever activist in support of Palestine in, in support of the Palestine and their chant of course is from the river to the sea Palestine must be free which essentially means kill all the Jews to see them supporting that is pretty much like seeing a chicken protesting in favor of KFC like you just go what, 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 what? why are you in favor of KFC but this is what TikTok is doing to our minds we go oh oh we just jump on the latest bandwagon. Everyone's upset about this? Oh, I should be upset about it. Not to mention the fact that our kids have been indoctrinated by Marxism at most of our universities for the past 30 years, but it's absolute insanity. We're watching a collective delusion sweep over the earth. And we go, well, we're Christians. We know about the Bible. We know what will happen in the last days, so it shouldn't surprise us. But it's awfully painful when it's actually happening. It's one thing, again, to read about it, but to watch it unfold with our eyes. But it's not just these indoctrinated kids who have postgraduate degrees in queer postcolonial astrology or whatever, they're, whatever it is that we're paying the universities to teach our kids. It's also been pastors. It's been Christian leaders. I've been watching the language that a lot of Christians are using on social media. And they likewise are celebrating what happened, supporting the Palestinian cause as if it is overwhelmingly a cause of justice. Now, I want to be very clear. The Palestinian people are suffering. There's no question about that. But it's not primarily. Look, in situations like this, I want to be very clear. It's not purely good guys and bad guys. Reality is always a little bit more murky. But there are times when there is one side that is overwhelmingly far more on the side of right and one other side that is overwhelmingly not. And in the case of the Palestinian people, I just want to say the reason they are suffering is because their leaders are corrupt their leaders are happy to foment ongoing hatred and so forth because they have been indoctrinated. The primary occupation is the occupation of the mind that indoctrinates them and teaches them apocalyptic Islamic end-time theology that actually teaches them that God wants them to commit a genocide and kill Jews and that that's God's will and that the day of judgment will not come and paradise will not be established on the earth, so to speak, or sort of the this Islamic version of utopia will not be established until they kill those evil Jews. And if anybody tries to frame it differently, I'm just going to say you don't know what you're talking about. Hamas, as an organization, as part of their very charter, okay, their constitution, now they've removed it, I want to say about 10 years ago, they removed this because of pressure from the outside, because it looks bad, quite frankly. 
But as part of their charter, they used to have this very clear statement that is a prophecy. It's a tradition within Islam. And Muslims refer to it as the hadith, which is this prophetic tradition. Their prophetic traditions are called hadiths. They call it the hadith of the Garkard tree. And the, the prophecy says this. It says, the day of resurrection will not come unless the Muslims fight against the Jews and kill them. Until there are only a few Jews left hiding themselves behind a tree or a rock. And then the tree or the rock will cry out and say, Oh, faithful Muslim, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. That was part of their constitution. And it said, Hamas lives and exists to fulfill this prophecy. So is this, is this the group that we want our children and our churches supporting and getting behind because they believe they're... They're supporting the cause of justice in the earth. Or is that something that is fundamentally, transparently, easy to see for anyone? A rock can look at that and say, that's evil. And yet half of the spiritual leadership of the church today is blinded by, by, by satanic deception. There's no other way to say it. It is a demonic delusion that's sweeping the earth right now. So I've introduced myself, I'm an author, I'm a teacher, I travel all over the world, but the reality is who I am, or at least who I was, when the Lord found me about 33 years ago, was I was some little pathetic loser living in my divorced mother's basement, selling weed, thinking I was cool. I think it's very important that no matter how long we're in the Lord, no matter how much he's changed us, that we never, ever forget who we were when the Lord found us. Yeah. And there's still quite a lot of that little loser still in me, if I'm to be honest. <laughs> but we can never forget who we were, and we're only who we are now because of the Lord. And the gospel itself, this is a very simple reality. The gospel is, who is it for? Who's the gospel for? Somebody shout out. The poor. The gospel is for the poor. Now, it doesn't just mean the economically poor. I was actually a garbage man. Well, I guess I was a garbage man. After high school, I was a garbage man. And then I, I had just started working framing houses. I was a laborer. And so I was poor. Because people go, no, garbage men make good money. No, I was, <laughs> I was making six fifty an hour. We, we, we thought we would um, make a little extra money collecting cans out of the trash so we could make an extra 50 bucks a day or something. But it's not just for the poor financially. It's for the poor in spirit. It's for those who recognize that no matter how great they can put out a public appearance, they are still that pathetic loser living in their divorced mother's basement. It's for those who have a humble and meek attitude, who realize that apart from the Lord, we are nothing. None of us are anything. That's who the gospel is for. It's for those who, it's for the meek. It's for the forgotten. It's not for the cool kids in high school. It's for the losers. It's for the sick. It's for those with chronic illness. It's for the rejected, the forgotten, the marginalized, the hated, and for the ugly. You know who you are. No, just kidding. <laughs> just joking. So I want to just look at a few verses, a few passages, because this theme permeates the scriptures. The theme of the Lord's passion for the poor. I want to start out, I mean, I could just almost open the Bible and throw a dart, and I would hit any number of passages that highlight this reality. Psalm 72 says, let all kings, let all of those who think they are something, according to the eyes of the world, let the great and exalted ones, let them all bow down in homage to him, and all nations serve him. Everyone bows down to him. What will he do after he returns and establishes justice in the earth? He will rescue the poor who cry out. 
The poor are the ones that groan and cry out and say, something's wrong. Something is wrong with this world. Something's wrong with, this, with me. And they cry out to the Lord, and he hears the cries of the poor. The Lord will rescue the afflicted who have no other helper. This is the nature of those who are poor. We don't have anything else. We don't have someone to champion our cause. The Lord says, I'll champion your cause. I'll respond to you. That's, those are the ones that he's concerned for. He will have pity. He will have compassion on the poor, the helpless. He will save the lives of the poor. He will redeem them from oppression, from violence, for their lives are precious in his sight. The Lord is not someone who shows favoritism. He doesn't care what nation you're from. He doesn't care about your ethnicity. He doesn't care about your family background or your wealth. He shows favoritism to the poor, to the humble, but he resists the proud. It's an issue of our view of ourselves in our own eyes, in our own eyes. The Lord shows compassion for the poor. Jesus himself in order to validate his ministry, think about this, in order to validate his ministry, to prove that he was the Messiah. How do you know that I am the promised one? He highlighted the fact that his ministry was directed to the poor. And he, in the synagogue, he opens up the scroll, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And what does he say? He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Why was the, what was the primary reason that he highlighted? He says, because he has anointed me, he has empowered me, he has sent me, he has commissioned me to preach the good news, the good news of deliverance, the good news of rescue to the poor. That's the gospel. The gospel is the insanity of this age, the injustice of this age, the unfairness of this age, the pain of this age is going to be reversed. There is a day of justice coming. It's called the day of the Lord. He's coming back. Those who are self-exalted, those who think highly of themselves in their own eyes, those who claw their ways to the top of the ladder and exploit those under them, they will be humbled they will be humiliated. They will be cast into the lake of fire. Those who put themselves at the bottom, those who found themselves at the back of the line, maybe you're born, whatever it might be, your circumstances, and you always felt like you were at the back of the line. You had no control of it. And then many put themselves at the back of the line willingly. But for those who are humble, for those who are servants, in that day they will be exalted. Everything gets flipped around. And in that day he'll say to the meek and to the humble and to the faithful, you take charge over ten cities. To the mother that's at home with three screaming kids who never gets acknowledged while her husband travels around the world and gets everyone claps for them. She's the one that gets exalted. And I'm hoping to be worthy to uh, mow her lawn in her mansion, or whatever it might be, you know. I don't know. Matthew 11, verse 25 through 26. The family of God, this family that we're part of. I love the fact that I can come to Pasco, Washington, and I have family members here. I can go down to some place in a rural village in Mexico, I've got family members there. I can go to Saudi Arabia. I've got family members there. I'm not sure about Bhutan. I'm just kidding. I think there's a few believers in Bhutan. Does anybody know where Bhutan is? People are like, is Bhutan really a country? Yes, Bhutan is real. No matter where we go, we have family members. Not just friends, family. But the family that we're part of is a family of fools. I love this passage. I love this passage. At that time, Jesus said, it's one of the few passages where Jesus, it, the language describes him like really celebrating, really getting excited. Like I imagine he was just, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. 
like he just busts out in praise, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent, and you've revealed them to infants, to babes. He's like, yes, Father, this was well-pleasing in your sight. It says, these things have been revealed to the foolish and the weak things of this world. Why did he choose me? Why did he choose you to shame that which is wise? At the day of judgment, the cool kids will be embarrassed and humiliated, but the humble and the meek will be lifted up. They'll be comforted. So it's a beautiful family that we're part of, but let's never forget, this is a family of fools, which explains a lot, by the way. (laughs) It does explain a lot. So I'm going to jump in and look at a really critical uh, passage that we should all be familiar with. Now, in every generation throughout history, people have rose up in order... With, with the goal of exterminating the Jewish people. In almost every generation throughout history, numerous times something rises up. And when you read these books, you read these scholars, they study anti-Semitism, they study Jew hatred. It's a really fascinating uh, field because they say there is no single reason. It's a field of study for which there is no answer if it's a secular study. They go, the Egyptians tried to wipe out the Jews. They had one particular reason. But then the Babylonians tried to wipe out the Jews. They had a completely different reason. And then, you know, you had the Assyrians, then you had Haman. I mean, even in the Bible, you have all of these different examples of people being stirred up for some various reason to wipe out the Jewish people. And then after the Bible, we have... Examples like, of course, you know, the Romans continued to perse- the, the pagan Romans continued to persecute the Jewish people. But you know what the next major group that started persecuting the Jews were? It was us. As Christians, I've written a whole book where I survey the history of primarily European Christian theologians who essentially were wrestling with what the scriptures said and how they should respond to the Jewish people. Let me just say something. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that says some really harsh stuff toward the Jews. If you were to record every single conversation that I have in my house with my kids, I've said some pretty harsh stuff to my kids, right? But if some stranger in the grocery store says those things to my kids, there's going to be a fight. Do you see the difference? Many of the things that are in this Bible, they are in family discussions. You have Moses, Moses saying harsh things. And that's okay. But if you're not Jewish and you start quoting these things and making social media posts and applying them to all Jews today, you might be profoundly out of line. And that's what we see a lot of because the the Bible actually has a lot of ammunition both in Torah and throughout the prophets, they are rebuking their own people, calling them back to faithfulness. But then you have all these people with these sort of distorted conspiratorial ideas that are just being fomented on social media and YouTube and TikTok, and they start regurgitating and reciting this stuff, and they think they're following the path of God. There's a tremendous amount of this. One of the little tropes or one of the little ideas that's floating around there, you'll see it a lot. If you pay attention, um, you'll see people say, the Jews that live in Israel today, they're not real Jews. They're fake Jews. And I won't get into the whole history of this. Um, Essentially, I mean, it's just always some weird thing. But essentially they say, at a certain point in history, there was this kingdom, this Turkish, ethnically Turkish European kingdom, the Khazars, and many of them converted to Judaism. And so what this sort of thing will claim is that all of the Jews in Israel today, they're not even Jews, they're fake Jews. They're these Caucasian European Jews, real Jews would be more Semitic, which Jews come in really every color. It's a every color on the melanin spectrum, so to speak. You've got different... 
Um, they can all be ethnically Jewish. But here's the thing, biblically speaking, Judaism or, or being Jewish, it's not simply a matter of ethnicity. Yes, it started as the children of Israel, his 12 sons, but it's also, and this is where it gets a little technical, it's also covenantal which is to say that God made covenant with Israel. And if you're a Gentile, it doesn't matter if you're Japanese or Canadian or from Bhutan. If you convert to Judaism and join yourself to the God of Israel through the Mosaic covenant, biblically speaking, you're Jewish. You're not ethnically Jewish, but you're just as Jewish as anyone else. And so... You see this even in the lineage of Jesus. You see these Gentiles. They're actually part of his family. And they gave them, they became part of that family. So it doesn't matter. Look, if, if there's any reality, and by the way, scientific studies, DNA studies have shown that that whole thing about the Khazars and the people in Israel, it's not even true. It's not even true. But the point is, it doesn't matter what their ethnicity is. If they say they're Jewish and they're in the land of Israel, they're Jewish. I want to look at Joel chapter 3. Because if, if anyone out there watching this, you don't agree with me, the Word of God makes it absolutely clear. So Joel chapter 3, and we could point to several other passages very similar to this. He says, in those days and at that time, he's talking about the last days, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, after he has restored the land of Israel, he says, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. The valley of Jehoshaphat is the valley that runs in between, it's Jerusalem. Okay, it runs in between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. The Lord says, I will gather all of the Gentiles, all of the nations, the surrounding nations, and I will bring them to Jerusalem. Why? To invade the land of Israel, to attack the Jewish people to try to conquer and defeat and ultimately to fulfill the hadith of the Garkard tree. And he says, and there, the Lord says, I will enter into judgment with them. Why? Why will the Lord enter into judgment with the nations? In our future, in the last days, perhaps in our very near future, the Lord says, I will enter into judgment with them there because of my people, my inheritance, Israel. So someone can say all they want, those people in the land of Israel are not true Israelites. We are the true Israelites. We are the true Israel or whatever. You see these things in the church. You see it in various cultic groups. You see it on social media. The Lord says those people in the land right now that are about to be invaded, those are my people. That's my inheritance. You go, but the majority of them don't believe in Jesus. How can they be my people? Because the Lord calls the things which are not yet as though they already are. And Paul said the day is coming after Jesus returns that they will look upon the one that they pierced and that we also pierced with our sins and they will weep and repent and mourn. And Paul the Apostle said at that time, all Israel will be saved. The survivors, the remnant, they will all be saved. And so the Lord looks at them now, even though the majority are in unbelief, knowing what the future holds, and he says, that's my inheritance. That is my people, Israel. It says the nations, now why? Why do they invade the land? The nations have scattered the Israelites into foreign countries. What we just saw on October 7th, where they invaded, killed, plundered, raped, and then kidnapped, that was a small foreshadow of what the scriptures describe will happen on a massive scale in the days ahead. He says, they will scatter my people into foreign countries. They will scatter them up and they divided up my land. They cast lots for my people. They bartered a boy for a prostitute. They sold a girl for wine, human trafficking, etc., etc. He's describing exactly what we just saw unfold, but on a far bigger scale. And this is what the prophet, this is what the Lord spoke through the prophet Joel in the range of 3,000 years ago. How did Joel know that the geopolitical realities of the world right now would be exactly what he described? Because the Lord was speaking through him. The Lord was speaking through him. Now I want to look at Another passage, Matthew 
25, the parable of the sheep and goat judgment. This parable, or this passage, is part of what's called the Olivet Discourse. The reason it's called that is because Jesus gave this discourse, or this sermon, or this lesson on the Mount of Olives. So if you read the whole story, it's in Matthew 24. Jesus is leaving the temple with his disciples, and they go, wow, look at the temple's amazing, you know, they're, they're, it's impressive. And he goes, I tell you the truth, not one stone will be left. This whole thing's getting torn down. And they go, whoa, that's pretty freaky. Um, we'll give us some, you know, teach us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of the end of the age? And he goes on and he gives a big sermon about the end times. And in that, actually, I'm going to jump back and read a little part of that. He says, Matthew 24, verse 15, So when you see the abomination of desolation, this is referring to the Antichrist, after he invades the land of Israel, will set up something referred to as the abomination on the Temple Mount. And it says, when you see that, it was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. It's beautiful the way Jesus is interacting with the previous prophets. He goes, like, when you see this that Daniel talked about, Standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, let anyone in Judea flee, flee to the mountains, get out. And then he says, a man on the rooftop shouldn't come down to grab his iPad or his phone. No, just go. His coat, woe to the pregnant women in nursing, pray that your escape won't happen on sight. Okay, here it is, verse 21. For at that time, there will be a great distress, a great tribulation such as the kind that has not taken place from the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. The single greatest horrific nightmare tribulation will happen at that time. Unless those days were cut short, no one would even live. And so this is exactly what Joel was speaking of. I will gather all the nations down to Jerusalem. So Jesus speaks of the worst, most unparalleled horrific nightmare that has ever been that has ever been. And then skipping forward here, he's still in the same sermon, Matthew 25, he says this, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, that's when Jesus comes back, he splits the sky, shining like the sun with an army of angels with him. When he comes back, he's describing his own return, then, then he will sit on his glorious throne. What is that? That is the throne of his father David. It is the royal Jewish Davidic monarchy will be reestablished. There's covenants that God made with David. He said, someone will come forth from you and he will sit on your throne forever. But let's just call it what it is. It's the restoration of the Jewish monarchy that will rule over the earth. So you get all these conspiracy theorists that go, the Jews rule the world. You go, no, they don't. But someday a Jew will rule the world. He's still Jewish. He's coming back as a Jew in a physical Jewish body and all nations will bow down to him. So it says, when he comes back, then he will sit on his throne of glory. And by the way, he has not come back yet and he's not sitting on his throne of glory yet. So for all of those Christians who say, all biblical prophecy is already fulfilled back in the first century. I mean, it's just like fundamentally unbiblical. Excuse me. That's the first time I've ever done that from the pulpit. <laughs> all nations will be gathered before him. All the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate the sheep from the goats. As a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now I'm gonna do a little demonstration here to try to help you visualize it. Jesus was on the Mount of Olives when you're on the Mount of Olives, okay, so let's say you guys are on the Mount of Olives. You guys are the Mount of Olives, and I'm over here on the other hill across the valley that is the Temple Mount. So if you've seen pictures, when you're on the Mount of Olives, you're looking across, you see the wall, and then up on the wall is the Golden Dome, and then you see in the wall, you see this gate. That's called the Eastern Gate, sometimes called the Messiah Gate. 
It's believed that that will be the gate that Jesus will actually enter through when he comes back. But in between us is a valley. It's most often called the Kidron Valley. It's also known as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. The, the tomb of Jehoshaphat is down in there in the valley. So Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and he says, after all the nations, after the worst thing that has ever happened in human history happens, the Son of Man will come back, the King of the Jews will come back, and all the nations will be gathered before him. Joel said all the nations will be gathered up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And he says as a judge, as a shepherd, he'll separate the nations and he'll put the sheep on his right. Now where you are, where he was on the Mount of Olives in his day, the sheep gate was over here on the right. On the left was the valley of Gehenna. That's essentially what the Bible uses to refer to as hell, the lake of fire. He says, the goats will be on his left, and they, the, his disciples knew exactly what he was talking about. Goats go to hell. Sheep, on the other hand, he says, you come inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from before the foundations of the world. And then he goes on, and Christian theologians have just really wrestled with this passage. What does it mean? He says, why will he send some into hell? Why will he give some the kingdom? Because I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. He didn't say because they were hungry. He said because I was hungry. Jesus himself personally identifies with Israel. He identifies with the people who are hated, with the people who all the nations hate and want to kill. He identifies with the poor. And you go, well, Israel's a rich nation with all this military. Yes, they are. After World War II, they said, we're not going to let this nonsense happen again after the Holocaust. We're not going to trust these Gentiles anymore. But they're still the most hated. Israel today, they cannot figure out. These secular unbelievers, they're like, why does everyone hate us? Why? Where's your brother-in-law? He's got the dreadlocks. Is he in the room? Brother. brother. There he is. Okay. So I'm going to make a joke here, but it's true. Israel has more white people with dreadlocks per capita than any other nation in the world. It is a country of hippies and peaceniks. They want nothing more but just a place to raise their family and live at peace and not have everyone want to kill them. Like, it's a very interesting nation. They can't figure out in their secular mind, why does everyone want to kill us? We don't want to kill them. It's because Satan is... Satan knows biblical prophecy. He knows where it's all going. He fully understands these things. So listen, something is coming which is so consequential that Jesus actually says that on the day of judgment, he, I mean, look, we're saved by grace through faith, right? That's what, how we're saved. But if that faith doesn't produce action, then it's not real. Jesus said something so horrible is coming that the judgment of the nations will actually be determined by how we responded to the coming crisis, the coming controversy of Israel. Israel is a, it's a test for the world. And the, 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 the battle lines are being drawn. Are we gonna stand with Jesus who identifies with his people? He goes, because I was hungry and you fed me. You took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I don't know where all these naked people are, but everybody has all these poor... I'm going to start a naked ministry. I need a lot of donations. Um, you got the naked, the poor, the hungry, but you fed me, he says. He identifies with his people. This is absolutely critical. I'm going to end right here. That we as believers discern what's unfolding in the earth right now, that we know the word of God, that we don't fall for the nonsense, the lies, the propaganda of TikTok, of Satan, that we stand with the poor, with the hated, with the marginalized. We stand with his people, Israel, his inheritance. Amen? Watching this sermon. If this was a blessing to you, would you let me know in the comments below what stood out to you from this message? What are you taking home with you from this message? Also, if you enjoyed these messages, would you help us and hit 
thumbs up to this video and subscribe to our channel so you can get new videos every single week delivered to you on your YouTube app. If you go to hungrygen.com forward slash sermons, you'll actually be able to download the transcript, the notes, and the quotes of this sermon and the rest of all of our sermons free of charge. Until next time.